This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, well, first I'd like to, to, before I begin my formal remarks, to thank uh, Professor Harvey Clare and, of course, Randy Strahan, my former colleagues, for the invitation to come back. As he said, it is in many ways a homecoming for me. I spent more than a decade here, uh, and very happily, too, and it was with some regret that I, I left. Um, I'm very pleased to see also in the audience, in the, amidst the sea of faces, I don't know, a few students whom I do recognize. Now, math was never my strong suit. Those students that I recognize are either seniors about to graduate or have been failing for some time. <laughs> and uh, I won't say which I guess it is. Um, I've been asked, my original assignment was to speak about some, legacy, some aspect of the legacy uh, bequeathed to us by Greek antiquity. Now, that subject is vast, as you can imagine. And so it has to be narrowed down. And I am very eager to share with you my profound thoughts about Greek architecture and vases and Spartan agricultural practices. But I've decided to limit myself to Greek philosophy, more precisely to Greek moral or political philosophy, more precisely still to the moral and political thought of Aristotle. In other words, I preferred to narrow rather than to broaden my focus today. But as I hope you'll be willing to grant me eventually, if not right now, to focus on Aristotle is to broaden one's focus. Now, before I turn to speak about Aristotle, I want to read uh, a, a something much closer to home than anything written by some very old Greek fellow. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bond, bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I didn't write that. I ask for, only for the moment that you keep these words in mind. So, my purpose today is to introduce you to perhaps the single most influential philosopher in the history of the West, and I should add not only the West, Aristotle. It's no exaggeration to say that the absorption of Aristotle's thought fundamentally changed the course of intellectual life for countless human beings in the West and in the East, in antiquity and in the Middle Ages and maybe even now. Aristotle's thought was absorbed by the Jewish, Islamic, and Christian traditions, for example, and so was preserved by them. According to Maimonides, the greatest Jewish thinker of the Middle Ages, Aristotle was, quote, the chief of the philosophers, all of whose doctrines concerning the sublunary world, that is, this world, everything below the moon, they were simply true. The great Islamic thinkers, Al-Farabi, Averroes, and Avicenna, all wrote very close commentaries on the text texts of, of Aristotle, whom they referred to simply as the philosopher. The philosopher said, and everybody knew who you meant. And though Dante was, of course, compelled to put this pagan fellow in hell, uh, Dante's description of its first circle, with its, quote, sweet brook, green meadow, and serenity, makes it seem like a very attractive place indeed for, quote, the master of those who know. Even Thomas Hobbes, the great early modern philosopher, paid Aristotle a very high compliment by declaring him enemy number one. Because Aristotle's hold on the European universities down through the 17th century was so great that it took a Thomas Hobbes to break it, finally. My introduction is going to comprise two parts of very unequal length. In the first and shorter part, I'll say a little bit about Aristotle's biography, his life, and his work. And then in the second longer part, I'll try to make the case why we, you and I, in the 21st century, might turn with something like serious interest to the study of Aristotle, not as a kind of mummified relic or an interesting historical artifact, but as a source, perhaps, of living guidance who can help us grapple here and now with the most fundamental questions we face as human beings. And to do this, I'll also speak of some of the central questions that we encounter in the two books that form what he calls his philosophy of human affairs, the Nicomachean Ethics and the Politics. 
So first to his biography. I once read the following biography of Aristotle. Quote, Aristotle was born, then he philosophized, then he died, close quote. The point is clear, that Aristotle is a philosopher is the crucial fact about him. Everything else is just happenstance. But I'll try and be a little bit more expansive than that. Aristotle was, of course, a Greek, born in about 384 BCE in the northern city, city of Stagira. But at 17, so roughly your age, freshman in the room, he traveled to the center of learning, uh, the, the Atlanta of the ancient world, namely Athens. Pericles, you know, the great statesman, called it the School of Greece. Uh, and he there became the pupil, I assume the most impressive pupil by far, of Plato. In fact, Aristotle was to remain at Plato's side at the academy until the latter's death in 347, about 20 years. So your parents begin to complain that you're spending five or six years in college. You can tell them that Aristotle spent 20 with Plato. Aristotle thus forms a link in what surely must be the most impressive chain of thinkers the world has ever seen. Aristotle was the student of Plato, who was in turn the student of Socrates. But the constellations were once aligned uh, in just the, the way to produce three great philosophers in close succession has to be one of fate's most beneficent blessings. Well, after Plato's death, uh, Aristotle left Athens, and he eventually made his way to the court of Philip of Macedon, where, at least according to some sources, uh, he became for a time the tutor of young Alexander yet great, but soon would be. Shortly after the death of Philip, uh, Aristotle returned to Athens in 335, and there found his, his own school known as the Peripatetics. And there Aristotle lived and taught and wrote for about a dozen years or so until 323, when he too, like his intellectual grand, grandfather Socrates, was brought up on charges of impiety. We can talk about that if you want. But unlike Socrates, Aristotle chose to get the hell out of Athens to prevent it from, quote, sinning against philosophy a second time. He died in Calchas at about 322. Now, not all of his works have survived, unfortunately, but those that uh, do make up about 23 volumes in a standard Greek-English edition. And the range of subjects covered by those works is astonishing, from logic to rhetoric to the motions and parts of animals to morals and politics to physics and something called metaphysics. In short, Aristotle took as his proper study the whole of philosophy, from the subhuman, plants and animals, to the human, morals and politics, to the suprahuman, the cosmos. I turn now to the question of why we should study Aristotle with serious intent. That is, not just to learn about him, which we just did, but maybe from him. After all, in the list of subjects I just gave, Many in this room probably think that modern science and modern philosophy have done a much better job than he did. Maybe because I'm a professor of political theory, I want to begin from a political consideration in the preliminary case why you might want to take Aristotle seriously. You and I, we are blessed to live in something called a modern liberal democracy, a liberal democracy. This means that the rule of, for, and by the people, to paraphrase Lincoln, has as its chief purpose the protection and promotion of liberty, freedom. Or to put the same point a little bit differently, liberal democracy is devoted to protecting certain inalienable rights that belong to us as individuals, even prior to joining any community. And these individual rights were neatly summed up by Thomas Jefferson in the words that I quoted near the beginning. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And there is, if you think about it, a kind of rank hierarchy in these rights. We have to be alive in order to be free. And we have to be free in order to pursue happiness. Now, it is the mark, of course, of a free country that it doesn't tell us, its citizens, how best to do that, to pursue happiness. It's up to each of us, as autonomous individuals, to chart the course of our life. Because we live in a modern liberal democracy, we enjoy the maximum possible freedom within which to pursue happiness, as each of us understands that phrase. And this, of course, is the great promise of modern liberal government. But precisely because that government is limited, or because it wants to guarantee individual freedom, it largely refuses to take on the responsibility of answering for us the question 
of what the good life is for human beings. In other words, our government or our way of life declines to identify what the best use of our individual freedom may be. Think of it this way. On the morning of your 18th birthday, I assume everyone has had this experience, you wake up and put both feet on the floor and say, now I'm free. <laughs> and what's the second thought that occurs to you? You see? It still occurs to you. Now what do I do? I'm stunned. I have no idea now that I'm free. No one can tell me what to do. And so the great promise of life in a modern democracy brings us face to face with its greatest challenge. We have to try to understand how we might, each of us, take full advantage of the remarkable liberty available to us, and so pursue happiness in the best way possible. We don't want to screw it up, in other words. And it's just here that we citizens of a liberal democracy may find ourselves a little bit awed or overwhelmed by the prospect of answering, without much official guidance, the all-important question of how to live or what to do with our freedom. Left only to our own resources, how can we know which are the serious and worthwhile lives from among the whole smorgasbord of lives we might choose from? Unfortunately, as Alexis de Tocqueville once observed, and you should read Tocqueville before you leave college, life in America is marked by both very great liberty and very great conformity or conformism. Given the nearly perfect freedom to pursue happiness, we each think best, when push comes to shove, we tend to choose lives very similar to one another. This is one of the strangest and the most disturbing facts of life in modern America. Now, in order to make full use of individual liberty that we enjoy in this country, we need to make full use of the only education that's expressly geared to prepare us to be fully free. And I mean a liberal education. And those of you who have already, most of you in the room, have already made two important decisions. A, to come to a liberal college, liberal arts college, and B, to take the voluntary course. Good for you. Your work's not done, but it's a first step. And once we realize the singular importance of liberal education for citizens in a liberal democracy, we very quickly come to one name, Aristotle. To mention only one reason now, we find in Aristotle a singular laser-like focus on the question of what the good life is for a human being. And he was of the view that this question can be answered by us. That the question of how to live does not, in fact, rest merely on opinion or taste or personal quirk. Now, this very fact that Aristotle thought that human reason can answer and answer correctly the question of the best life for a human being shows already that Aristotle is, in important ways, very different. The proof has to be in the pudding, of course. But for now, I say only this much. Precisely because Aristotle does not hold all the same premises we do, even as he raises a question that we can see is of vital importance to us. This means that he can teach us to look at things in a new way, in an intriguing way, and maybe a superior way. You have to look into it to see. There's also a fairly uh, obvious objection to the idea that we can learn something from Aristotle now. And it goes something like this. Isn't Aristotle's thought a product of his time? A reflection of the fact that he was, say, a male member of the aristocratic elite of the fourth century BCE. This is a complex question. In the question period, you can come after me. I just make one observation. As we'll soon see, the central concept of Aristotle's political and moral thought is the idea of virtue, arete. Uh, and in his very famous doctrine of the moral virtues, he lists 11 in total. More on that in a minute. Each of these he presents as a means between two extremes, the two extremes being the vices, of course. For example, courage is the mean in the middle. Recklessness, not being afraid of anything, is one extreme. Being afraid of everything or cowardice is another. But Aristotle's list of virtues and vices is not a mere reflection of current opinion in his day. And I can prove it. Why? Because as he goes through this list, he indicates that several of these virtues and vices have no name. And therefore, he comes up with a name. He coins a name. And that means that if he'd, he'd gone up to a man or a woman on the street, fourth century Greece, and said, what do you think of this or that, they probably couldn't come up with an 
In other words, he wasn't simply just parroting, parroting uh, the thoughts of the day. Well, let me turn now to give a sketch of the way in which Aristotle approached the question of the good life. As I just said, at the center of his moral, political thought is this thing called arete, virtue or excellence. As human beings, we strive for excellence, for virtue. Uh, and nobody before him or after has subjected this idea to such a searching inquiry. In the Ethics and the Politics, Aristotle divides virtue into essentially two kinds, as you have to remember. Moral virtue, or virtue related to the excellence of character, action. And then intellectual or contemplative virtue, the excellence of the mind or understanding. Now, as I said, Aristotle arrives at exactly 11 moral virtues. There are not 10, there are not 12, and this list is meant to be exhaustive. So what I want to do now, if you'll permit me, I'll just list them rather quickly in the order that he takes them up. First is courage. That is the right stance toward the repulsive force that is pain. Moderation the right stance toward the attractive pull of pleasure. You can resist pain, fear, and resist pleasure. Two, then a twin, uh, twin virtues, generosity and mag what he calls magnificence. This is the virtue related to money, generosity or liberality, uh, that you're able to part with money, so that if you buy a friend lunch, it doesn't ruin your day. <laughs> magnificence is the same thing, but on a grander scale. If you endow a wing of a hospital, that's what he calls magnificence. The next two are also paired, and they have to do with the right attitude toward honor. What he calls greatness of soul, sometimes translated magnanimity. We can talk about that later. And ambition. And then he takes up four what he calls social virtues. Gentleness, not being too angry. Friendliness, truthfulness, wittiness. And then, finally, 11th, justice. This list is striking both for what it includes and for what it excludes. Courage, justice. I think that would probably make anybody's top 10. Does anything strike you as odd that's missing? This is the audience participation. So you have to work. Anything strike you as strange that's missing? Love. Love is not friend friendliness is, which is close, but it ain't love. That's true. Wisdom. Wisdom, but that's a separate, that's part of the intellectual, that is intellectual. He get, that gets a big treatment later. Um, well, when I teach this, I often ask for a list you know, at the beginning. Toleration, it ain't there. Compassion, it ain't there. Piety, God, it ain't there. He's silent about it. How then does Aristotle arrive at this list and only this list? Uh, to explore, to answer that question is to begin to enter into the heart, I think, of Aristotle's thought in both its similarities and its differences. Now, in Greek, it's possible to speak of the virtue not only of a human being, as I just did, but of animate, other animate and even inanimate objects. It just means excellence, essentially. So, so Aristotle speaks of the virtue of an eye, which would be what? Seeing, sure. Uh, you could speak of the virtue of a table, which would be to be sturdy. Um, a, a basketball coach could list for you the, the virtues of a, of a good basketball player. In all these cases, the virtue or the virtues are derived from a specific task or activity. Seeing, in the case of eye, holding things up in the case of a, a table, dunking a ball. And so the question becomes, what's the counterpart? What's the activity for a human being? Such that you could say, these are the virtues. These are the marks of excellence. What is that? Uh, Aristotle answers this question first by means of a process of elimination. The activity, he says, that's peculiarly ours, or human, can't be one of nutrition and growth. Plants do that. So for those of you who think that the peak of life is sitting on the sofa with a bag of Doritos, just uh, changing the Doritos into um, nutrition, if that's what's in them. That ain't it. That ain't it. Neither can it be a life, he says, of sense perception, of hearing, tasting, seeing, touching. So for those of you who think that the peak of life is touching, let's say, of a certain sort, uh, this is wrong. The seniors get this joke. The freshmen are clueless. What I'm talking about, which is a good thing. I'm pleased. No, he says, cattle and horses also live for sense perception. So, yeah, that's part of it. And of course, we need nutrition. But what's the peculiarly human thing? Eventually, he comes to a very famous definition of the proper task of a human being. It's an activity of soul, not the body, in accordance with 
The full and proper use of the rational part of our soul, then, is the human activity. And the human virtues could presumably be derived from it. Think of basketball again. And it's obviously true in the case of the intellectual virtues, what he calls prudence or practical judgment, and wisdom. But what about the moral virtues? Is that the way he proceeds? No. In fact, Aristotle resists the temptation to derive the various moral virtues from any activity at all, even thinking. For example, it would have been so easy for Aristotle to make this argument. We all live in a political community, and all political communities need justice. Therefore, we need citizens who are just, and therefore justice is a virtue. Or another example, which may be even clearer. You can't have a political community that lasts if you're not willing to have people who fight for it. You need soldiers, and therefore courage. Courage is a virtue because it contributes to the community. This is not his argument. He never says that about justice or courage. And this is a puzzle. He expects us to, in a way he leads us to expect him to do that. He does not. Why not? To derive the moral virtues from their service to some other supposedly higher goal is to make them means to that goal. It's to subordinate the moral virtues to something higher or better or more serious. This he refuses to do. He wants to preserve, in other words, the seriousness of moral dedication as we experience it in everyday life. I give this example. You're walking along uh, uh, campus to the duck. Good Emory reference. And you find a wallet stuffed with cash and the last ID, too. You can do one of three things, I suppose. First, what? Ditch your cash. Who said? <laughs> Take the cash, ditch the wallet. And what else? Give it back. Give it back. I'll refine this suggestion in the following way. You take the wallet with all the cash and the idea, ID, put it in a wallet, I mean an envelope, and in the upper left-hand corner, you very carefully write your own name and return address. Third example, you get the same envelope, put the wallet intact, send it off anonymously. Ladies and gentlemen, which do you admire more? I'm not asking God knows what you would do. <laughs> I just want to know which you admire more. Why? So why did, you, why did you return the wallet, Ben? Out of compassion for the person who lost it. Yeah, but compassion is not an Aristotelian virtue, so no, you didn't. <laughs> How about this? We say this in English. It was the right thing to do. You know this phrase. Just because it was the right thing to do. And if some, your roommate is completely corrupt, says, well, why, why, why? From Aristotle's point of view, there's a certain problem with your roommate. Aristotle would put it in this way. He wouldn't say it's the right thing to do. He would say, to act virtuously, to carry out the moral virtues, is for the sake of what's noble or beautiful. It was a noble thing you did. That's what he would say. Virtue, then, both moral and intellectual, is central to Aristotle's thought. But in the ethics especially, he's also concerned with something else that, oddly enough, is at least as fundamental as virtue, happiness. In fact, Aristotle begins his whole philosophy of human affairs not from virtue, that comes up later, but by inquiring into the character of the good, the highest or greatest good that we seek. This is how he argues. In everything that we do, we have some good in mind as our goal, something advantageous or useful. <coughs> to give his example, why, uh, what the, well, the purpose of the art of bridal making is to make bridles. Why do you want bri bridles? I mean, it's good to have a bridle. Why? To control a horse. Why do you want to control a horse? This is a hard question because we don't have horses. Hmm? Yeah. In other words, you, he says it's for, it's, it's for the sake of the general's art, and the general's art is for the sake of victory in war. In other words, he thinks of the cavalry, not pleasure riding. And so from the, the lowly art of bridal making, he zooms all the way up to victory in battle. And so there's a chain of good. Think, think of it in your own life. Why did you study so hard in high school so that you could get good, good grades, so that you could go to Emory? Why did you go to Emory so that you could get good grades? So that you get on and on and on. And, and, he, and he says, either that process of searching for the next good, the higher good, has an end, stopping point, or it, there's a kind of infinite regress, and then there's a problem. And that stopping point that we see dimly with our mind's eye is the final good or happiness. Um, 
And once he arrives at this term happiness, he begins to unpack opinions about it. And he goes step by step through the most powerful opinions about it. And he says most people think that happiness has to be something obvious. And he gives three candidates, pleasure, wealth, or honor. Pleasure he treats very harshly, at least at this, this, this stage. Later he gives a more subtle intent. But he says, to live for the sake of pleasure is like a, to live like cattle, licking a salt lick in the middle of a field and saying, I'm happy. No, this is not it. What about wealth? He makes a very interesting argument. He says, it is literally impossible for you to live your life for the sake of money, to be rich. And for those of you sitting in the, here in the room who think you are living your life for the sake of wealth, you're wrong, and I can tell you in one sentence. Money is necessarily a means to something else. And insofar as you posit as your end, you misunderstand it and yourself. And he says, therefore, money can't be the end. It's, in a way, the universal means. But to what? Well, maybe honor. His treatment of honor is surprising or intriguing. Those who seek honor, he says, want honor they have genuinely earned. And that's for the sake of something real, something serious. People serious about honor wouldn't want a Nobel Prize for somebody else's work or for being a very good hula hoop dancer. And I might just note in passing, there's an interesting psychological puzzle involved in the Nobel Prize Committee's decision to give President Obama the Nobel Peace Prize very soon after he had taken the presidency, when he himself said he really hadn't done anything to deserve it. Why did they give it and why did he accept it? It's an interesting puzzle. Um, in Aristotle's case, he says, we want to be honored ultimately for virtue, for excellence, something real that we possess. Here then, virtue first enters the whole picture. Otherwise, it had all been about happiness. We really prize virtue above honor. But at this point, Aristotle says a, a, a surprising and in a way a disturbing thing. Let me quote him. Quote, even virtue proves to be imperfect as an end, rather incomplete, he says. For somebody might possess it while being inactive all his life and while, in addition, undergoing the greatest suffering and misfortune. Nobody could call somebody living in that way happy. In other words, even the dedication to virtue, which seems to be the end we seek, is defective from the point of view of happiness. Because as a matter of fact, the virtuous, the morally good, can suffer terribly. He didn't know of the Hebrew Bible, of course. But he has in mind here the, what we would call the problem of Job, the sad and heartbreaking spectacle of a good and righteous person who suffers terribly. And he says, that's possible. At this point, we seem to hit a brick wall. Aristotle has demonstrated that all we long, I'm sorry, we all long for something, that final good, call it happiness, that's surprisingly elusive. There's something uncanny about happiness. If I said to you, you know, I'm really worried about Frank, I think he's unhappy, you wouldn't stare back at me dumbfounded, what, what are you talking about? You would have a clear sense of what it was that I and yet happiness seems to be this thing that just when we extend our hand to meet it, it seems to vanish. It's a strange character. Aristotle begins again, therefore, this time with a new inquiry into happiness. And his chief purpose in doing so is to bring out our opinions or our hopes that that final good, that for the sake of which we do everything else, all of our strivings, um, that thing that we call happiness, he says, must uh, as such be complete or perfect and self-sufficient. In brief, he says, we believe or hope that there is some one good thing, the possession of which will leave us in need of nothing, and so render us happy, he says this explicitly. This, I think, is the deepest meaning of happiness. Today, the, the, the term gets somewhat debased. You know, you're at a restaurant, and the entree's not very good, and the waitress says, you know, how's your chicken? And you're really not very happy. Um, this is not happiness with a capital H, or unhappiness with a capital U. We, we picture happiness as this final end, uh, or the end of our striving, that it itself is complete or self-sufficient. In other words, to explain this, I could say, a thousand dollars, good or bad. Now you don't want to praise money after I, after I trash money. But as a general rule, a thousand dollars, good? Good. How about two thousand? Better, yes? Happiness is not of this character. You can't add more happiness to happiness and make it better. Happiness is this complete thing, which is, again, why, because 100,000 is better than 2,000 is a problem with money. It doesn't have this character, but it's complete. And once we possess it, it is self-sufficient, and we become self-sufficient 
quote, in need of nothing. There's a kind of satiety that goes together with it. This, I think, is the deepest meaning of happiness, which is probably too little understood today. And it's in this context that Aristotle uh, arrives at his famous definition that I mentioned of the human good, an activity of soul in accordance with reason. So happiness, apparently, is a certain kind of thinking or contemplation. But Aristotle gradually revealed that at least some of our hopes for happiness may not be realizable. He goes on to point out that even if we engage in the activity that he's identified as best, we still need what he calls external goods. Food, clothing, shelter. He's perfectly commonsensical or hard-headed about that. So he's not imagining someone sitting on a mountaintop you know, with no food, just thinking. This is not him. No, we need external goods. In fact, he includes friends in that and a family. An even graver problem. We think of happiness as residing in what he calls, quote, a complete life. Still quoting, for one swallow does not make a spring. In other words, if someone is cut down in his or her prime, a, a terrific life, 27, and then is cut down in a terrible accident, I don't think we would say that that person had a happy life. At a minimum, we would say, happy life, but then there's an asterisk, and you read it, and say, but unfortunately, he died so young. And that, that we sense is, is not what we mean by happiness. There's a problem with that. So there has to be external equipment, and there has to be what he calls a complete life. Right? Aren't our hopes for happiness, for that final, complete, and self-sufficient good, fundamentally, and maybe tragically, exposed to the sway of chance? And if this is so, don't we have to conclude that happiness in its truest form, not as a kind of passing contentment, but as a thing that lasts, may not exist? And there is some reason to think that Aristotle adopts this harsh conclusion. But rather than try to establish here Aristotle's final view of things, which is certainly a controversial matter, I want to focus instead on the serious questions, and the serious alternatives, that open up to us once we've seen both what we truly mean when we speak of happiness and the exposed or fragile character of happiness. Because Aristotle immediately raises the question, of whether someone who has died is aware of the fate of his survivors, either pleased when they do well or pained when they don't. He raises, in other words, the question of an afterlife. Because this is surely one way to reconcile ourselves to the suffering of a Job. Those who were vir virtuous but unfortunate in life may enjoy rewards in the next life. So under Aristotle's tutelage, in other words, we see that the question of the fate of the soul after death is of central importance to us in thinking about happiness here and now. Aristotle also suggests the importance of the dedication to moral virtue, if not as a guarantee of happiness, then as a kind of guard against misery. And here the dedication to moral excellence comes into its own. As he indicates in sometimes very beautiful language, even if moral virtue cannot make us happy, can secure our happiness. There is a certain satisfaction that we can receive from holding our head high, even or precisely when things go terribly, horribly wrong. The person who acts in accord with moral virtue, quote, will bear the vicissitudes of chance most nobly and with perfect decorum in all circumstances. Nobility shines through even in the worst circumstances when one bears many great misfortunes with good grace, not because he's insensitive to pain, but rather because he's noble and great soul. And the example he here gives more than once is Priam in, in uh, Homer, who lost everything in the fall of Troy. And yet, being a virtuous man, he, he wasn't happy. He lost 50 sons, but, but still he, he had a certain dignity about him. Let me try to summarize some key points. Aristotle argues that in all that we do, we seek some good. You can try and refute that in the question here. But there can't be an endless striving of partial good after partial good, or we would be caught in a kind of infinite regress. And so with our mind's eye, we can at least glimpse that final good, what, which justifies the pursuit of all the lesser good in our lives, and that we call happiness. The utility for us of Aristotle's philosophy of human affairs consists not least in his unpacking of this term, happiness, in the first book of the Ethics. To repeat, he argues that what we mean by it is not some passing, pleasantness or contentment, but a good that is complete and self-sufficient, 
that renders us complete and self-sufficient. Such a good presupposes possession of merely external goods. And too often, we make the possession of those external but lesser goods <coughs> our chief aim in fact. But the graver problem comes in the force form of chance. Not only are those external goods exposed to misfortune, Hurricane Katrina, say, but so too are our very lives. And yet part of what we mean when we speak of a happy life is that that life is lived to its proper or natural end. What's more, even if we ourselves are enjoying good fortune, it's just you know, coming up roses every time, doesn't the awareness of our exposedness to chance, which unfortunately I've just inflicted on, doesn't the awareness of our exposedness to chance cast a shadow on any possible happiness? Now, it's at this juncture that Aristotle re introduces what might be called theological questions. His point is this. You can't grapple seriously with the question of how to live here and now without at some point in confronting the questions of whether or not our soul lives on after death, whether it can then be said to be happy, and finally, whether there are gods or a god who are actively concerned with our happiness. These as questions. Aristotle himself points to two serious possibilities. The first one focuses above all on moral virtue. The dedication to moral virtue holds out the promise, at least, of a kind of completion and contentment, and as we saw, a certain nobility, as in the case of, of Priam. Such a view is compatible with, it may even ultimately require, a belief in the immortality of the soul and in the existence of but Aristotle also points to another way to complete human life, intellectual or contemplative virtue. This, in a way, is the climax of the whole ethics. I noted before that for Aristotle, as impressive and vital as moral virtue is, intellectual virtue is the highest peak simply. About, about that, he's perfectly explicit. Recall that the peculiarly human activity is thinking, the activity of the rational part of the soul. It's a long and difficult question as to how or, or whether the exercise of this peak virtue can protect us from chance. After all, wasn't Socrates executed? And wasn't Aristotle run out of town? Here, Aristotle, in the climax of the ethics, offers two different paths to pursue in which intellectual virtue might complete us. According to the first path, he says this. The intellect is the best or most divine thing in us. And to live in such a way as to perfect it is to enjoy a sort of divine happiness to the extent possible for a human being. Quote, happiness then is coextensive with contemplation. And the more contemplation is possible for some, the happier they are, not accidentally, but in reference to the contemplation itself. For it is itself honorable. As a result, happiness would be a certain contemplation. Or as he put it somewhat more accurately just before, the life that accords with the intellect would be, quote, the happiest one. That is, the happiest available to human beings. This, it is true, solves the problem of happiness to the extent that it does, in part by limiting our dependence on the things of chance. Since, to repeat, the life of contemplative virtue, he says, is the most self-sufficient one. But no human life is fully self-sufficient. And so Aristotle's argument thus far grapples with the problem of chance also by allowing us to see the necessary or the natural limits attending our lives, and so encouraging us to accept those limits. More on that in a minute. To accept the supreme goodness of perfecting the human intellect doesn't solve the problem of chance in the sense of making it go away. You can't get hit by a bus. To understand the world as it is and ourselves as we are is to see that our original or pre-philosophic hope for a complete happiness may not be realizable. But this, isn't, this is not Aristotle's last word on the matter. Because the second path he sketches suggests not that we imitate a godlike contemplation, but rather that those who actively seek to perfect their intellect, quote, also seem to be dearest to the gods. Still quoting, for if there is a certain care for human beings on the part of gods, as in fact there is held to be, it would be most reasonable for gods to delight in what is best most akin to them. This would be the intellect. And to benefit in return those who cherish this above all and honor it, on the grounds that these latter are caring for what is dear to gods, as well as acting correctly and nobly. What's the difference between the two? 
In the first, he simply says that if you perfect intellect to the extent possible, that is such happiness as is available to us. In the second, in what I just read, he said, well, maybe God would reward you for that. For that, excuse me. <clears throat> in other words, Aristotle's last word in the ethics is that there may be a sort of divine providence, one that rewards not moral virtue, but theoretical excellence. What then is the serious core of Aristotle's presentation of intellectual virtue, of thinking, in the face of the problem of happiness? I make only this tentative suggestion. Aristotle seems to indicate that the exercise of intellectual virtue or understanding permits us to see the necessities that govern us, the human equivalence of gravity, in other words. For example, the necessity of our mortality and so to begin to accept those necessities. There is a kind of calm acceptance, a philosophic resignation, that can accompany the life of contemplation. After all, in the act of exercising our highest human faculties, we're reminded of the good things that human beings are capable of and can enjoy, even as we understand the evils that may befall us and even must befall us. We can come to grasp the good things as what they are, in part because of the bad things to which they correspond. I'll give an example to clarify that statement. How many of would you say that health is a good thing? 82%. There are some, there's some hesitation, and there's reasonable hesitation, I would say. But as a rule of thumb, health is good. Certainly, I want to be healthy as a rule of thumb. What's the corresponding bad thing? Sickness. Imagine there was no such thing as illness or sickness. Remove it from our experience. We don't have a word for that. How would you view health in that case? Neutral, you say neutral. Yeah, why? I would even go so far as to say that if we lost the word for illness, we would lose the word for health. It, in a way, wouldn't exist, you know, because there would be nothing to compare it to. And so you, you couldn't say, are you healthy today, because there's no alternative. You couldn't be sick. And, and this is an example of something, um, of what goes together with understanding the necessities that govern us. The core of such happiness as it's available to us would be the knowledge of our deepest strivings, and the limits that nature imposes on them. So the core of human happiness, according to Aristotle, would be therefore a kind of self-knowledge. Now I want to conclude my remarks in the, in the very brief, briefly as follows. I once had the opportunity to be in Paris. And there's a very nice museum there, as you may know, called the Musée d'Orsay. There's a statue in this museum by the 19th century uh, sculptor Charles de Georges. And it depicts a young man seated in a chair, about to nod off, as many of you are, and in his right hand, this young man holds a metal ball. And directly below him is a metal bowl. It's a very strange image. It's based on a certain anecdote in an old author named Diogenes Laertius. And according to Diogenes, Aristotle used to study with a metal ball in his hand. And if he ever nodded off, the ball would fall out of his hand into the metal bowl and make a rattle thus waking him up. The sculpture, it seems to me, is a wonderful metaphor. Aristotle constantly sought for himself. He hungered for the greatest possible wakefulness. And in his humanity or generosity, he did what he could to encourage us, too, to attain such wakefulness. For this, I think we owe him a debt of gratitude, as I do to you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.